live. Good evening, everybody on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Logan Former here. You know that. You've probably been waiting since last week for this. I'm Where's gonna. I'm going to spend some oh, time today doing, um, I'm going to spend some time doing a technical piece, a layout that centers around the topic of how to stop a foreclosure. Um, it's, it's perfect timing. Today is Texas Tuesday, which if you don't know what that means, what that means is foreclosures are auctioned once a month in Texas, other states it's different, but here once a month, it's the first Tuesday of the month, and that's known to all of us invest in the investor world and those in the legal world, it's Texas Tuesday. We had, oh, about half a dozen foreclosures to stop during the week leading up to today. So this is a hot topic, and I thought it was fitting, and it made a lot of sense. So we're going to hang tight for a couple minutes while folks log in. Um, we'll give this probably about a two to a four-minute window so folks can get in, get comfortable. I've got 45 minutes more or less planned and I have every way that I have ever stopped a foreclosure from the cheap solution to the expensive solution, from the certain 100% it works solution to the, this is a flip up, a flip a coin kind of solution and let's just hope it works because we have low risk. So we're gonna spend some time walking through that I also made some great notes at the end about a couple different examples. Um, and I encourage you all to bring up topics, ideas, questions you have around this, um, around the topic, and we can talk through those. Then I've got my own I'm going to bring up at the end. So let's just see, uh, let's see what we got, where everybody's doing here. Uh, also, if you don't mind making some comments down there, I'm happy for you to Share this if you can. That'll get a little bit more folks engaged. We'll get better questions. And the more you help me get out there, the more I'm going to do it, folks. All right. I see that we're working here on Facebook. Kim Rendon, comment on the post, how to stop a foreclosure. Kim says, I can't see the link, but it's actually on the live version. So I don't know, Kim. I can't help you there, but if you go straight to my Facebook profile and click on my circle where my face is, boom, that'll get you live right there to me. You got it, Bill? You're on. Okay, everybody's on. I can't see in this version. Oh, because we're going through this program. Yes. Sometimes it says how many are streaming the pop, the comments pop up. Oh, there we go. But but that's not going to happen that, here. No. Okay. So Martha says hello. Martha, what's going on? Where are you seeing those comments? On the StreamYard thing. Deck. Oh. StreamYard puts them all together. Okay, well, gotcha. I'll tell you. If somebody says something, I'll tell you. All right. So I got a little help here today. And as the comments and questions pop in, um, I'm going to answer those as they happen. So we're a minute or two in. Let's give us a few more. If y'all got some questions, feel free to ask them. We'll shoot the breeze for a few minutes as folks start to roll in. I had about 150 folks um uh register that they were interested across the four platforms so i suspect we're gonna have some pretty good attendance today but yeah it is texas tuesday we had um last night if you know anything about my business or listen to me yap on social media very often you'll realize that we're a distress oriented shop we're looking after we're going after properties and looking for problems that's our business model the way markets are, even if though we're in a tougher market, things are still very competitive. And if you can't find an edge to get a better deal, you're not going to be able to make returns that have enough safety and protection, but also have really good returns. So that's why we go after those deals. I would say probably 70 to 80% of our deals have a significant level of distress and probably 50% of them either are delinquent in a payment um, of some sort, be it a mortgage or a creditor payment or taxes. Those are the kind of issues that come with them. And sometimes we're looking at the tax foreclosure, the mortgage foreclosure list. So we anticipate that a foreclosure is coming. Other times when we're dealing with just a normal troubled transaction, 
um, we get a notice or one of the parties, the transaction brings us a notice. It's a foreclosure notice. Sometimes it's far enough along um, in the process that it's actually coming in the next month and we didn't know. So we have to spring into action. But every month we probably stop anywhere between five to 10 um, foreclosures. And that happens in a variety of different ways, which we're going to go through here in a little while. What are we at? Are we at 507-ish? We're, we're seven minutes in. All right. We're going to get the show on the road. We've been waiting long enough. If you haven't made it in time, sorry. Okay. We'll start with who I am. Most everybody here is here because um, they've been on social media channels with me. They've been following me through this journey of building a real estate business, solving problems along the way, um, and enjoying this. So I've been in real estate for about 10 years. Um you know, I've done everything from build a house to a subdivision to do remodels. I don't know. I've got some um, industrial in the portfolio. I've got some multifamily. I've got some office. Um, I do a, a fair amount, my fair amount of land. Some of it is infill land. Some of it is rural land that we'll subdivide. Sometimes we flip. I've also got a portfolio of mortgage notes. So it's pretty much everything in the real estate business with the exception of you know, the, the grade A, you know, downtown Broadway asset. We don't deal with, you know, double, you know, triple A type stuff. Otherwise, we've got our hand in just about everything. Um, the curative title work and this distressed property acquisition makes up probably 70% of what we do here. Uh, this office has, normally we're about a 20 person office and probably 50% of them, those folks in the office are lead gen centric type roles. So, that's what the operation looks like. Okay, we're going to talk about how to stop a foreclosure. But first, I'm going to start out with why do we stop a foreclosure? The only reason you're going to stop a foreclosure, unless you're the one that's missing payments and you're about to lose your house, and that's that's a consumer situation. We're not here for the consumer situation. We're here for a business, a business case, a business model. Everyone here is an investor, a realtor, a wholesaler. Um, that's that's generally the audience here. And the reason you're going to stop a foreclosure, you're using it as a business tool. Most sellers that most of the time when you're looking to get deep discounted properties and really solving problems, you're going to find a component delinquency. A lot of times a foreclosure can happen. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're closing your deal and you're finished, and the foreclosure is a couple weeks away, that's all right. But if you're running up to that foreclosure and you don't have your deal done, meaning you haven't cleared up the title problems yet, you haven't rounded up all the sellers, you haven't gotten your buyer to the closing table or yourself or your seller isn't completely ready to close and the foreclosure day comes, bam, you're in trouble and you better figure out what to do with it. Otherwise, you're going to lose all the equity that you worked hard to contract. The seller is going to lose their position and the deal is done. If a foreclosure happens in the middle of your transaction, it's game over. So we've got a, we've gotten very skilled at stopping them. Um, this is a great tool for realtors. I know realtors that do nothing but foreclosures. They, they charge a little higher uh, rate than a lot of realtors. But the reason they do that, they can offer a service to postpone the foreclosure. And then they can get that buyer's property to market. And they handle it in a special way because they're skilled in foreclosures. So that's a business line for some realtors. In my, in my case, I'm buying the property that has a distress attached and I've got to wrangle that foreclosure off. So there are two different types of foreclosures that you see commonly in Texas. You've got a mortgage foreclosure and a tax foreclosure. The tax foreclosure is a judicial foreclosure and the mortgage foreclosure is a non-judicial um, deed of trust, power of sale foreclosure. Two different kinds. What you'll find is the judicial foreclosure typically happens when the county and the other tax authority stakeholders sue a property owner because they're not paying their taxes. And the county this is their last resort to sue to force the property to be sold so that the county can collect the delinquent taxes. This happens in the form of a lawsuit. The county sues the borrower and it can take anywhere from four or five months up to multiple years to get the lawsuit completed, serve all the proper notices and get the foreclosure to actually sell at the auction. So that's your judicial foreclosure. Now the non-judicial foreclosure 
is like all the mortgages that people out there have on their home. The regular old homeowner with an FHA loan, those loans have what's called um, a power of sale clause. And what that does is a trustee is appointed when the loan is originated, a lawyer for the big bank or a local lawyer for private lender, they're appointed to auction the property in the event the borrower stops paying and the lender has to make good on their collateral. The trustee has the authority vested in them by the power of sale clause and the deed of trust to sell that property at auction. And that's what we know of as the, um, the foreclosure auctions. So you've got your tax foreclosure and your mortgage foreclosure. One of them's a judicial foreclosure. The other one is a power of sale um, in the, shown in the deed of trust. Now, remember, the judicial foreclosure takes a long time, possibly a year or two. The deed of trust, just a regular mortgage, can happen in as little as 90 days in Texas. You've got certain procedure that's got to be followed. The, the lender has to notice uh, the borrower and take a few steps, but a mortgage foreclosure can happen as quick as 90 days in Texas. So anyway, that's what we're up against. Who needs to stop it? I mentioned this earlier. Realtors want to stop it because they're going to get some listings. Investors and wholesalers want to stop this stuff because we've got a business case. We're in the middle of a deal that hadn't gotten done. Um, frankly, I've used this to help some friends and family sometimes. This is a really meaningful thing. And the tricky part is you might even take this to a real estate attorney and tell them what's going on. But I guarantee you the real estate attorney is not going to approach it in the same angle that we will. They're going to immediately want to do it one way and they're not taking into consideration all the variables, all the risks and all the costs. But since we're in the middle of this, we do it every day. I can share all of that with you so that you can look at the half a dozen ways to stop a foreclosure and decide what is the right one for you and your client, you and your investor, or frankly, you, if you're in that spot. So that's who needs it. So let's talk about this for a minute. When I say to stop a foreclosure, what are we doing? I mean, what you're really trying to do is buy yourself a little bit of time. The question is, are you trying to bring that mortgage current or are you trying to just postpone the foreclosure a little bit so that you can get time to get done what you need done? That depends on what you're going to do. So, um, Let's see what my notes say here. Ah, so starting out in the beginning, you've got to understand you don't need to necessarily fix the foreclosure. You need to postpone it. So one of the tricks you'll find is a judicial foreclosure has all kinds of steps and processes that have to be done. It's called civil practice and procedure. That's the process that the tax or uh, tax authority has to go through to sue a borrower to make sure that they can do the foreclosure properly. Well, the way to remedy that is you either validate that that process was done correctly or pay the mortgage off. Um, but sometimes you've got ownership disputes. You have a dispute with the lender who's foreclosing. And all of these things are important to know. If a private lender didn't provide the proper notices to the buyer, you got a problem. If they haven't been uh, providing certain types of statements, you might have a problem. So it's important to understand what the rules look like so that you know what your, I guess, what tools you've got at your disposal. Now I'll say, you've got to look at this on our next couple of slides. It talks about all the different ways to stop the foreclosure. You've got to look at this from a risk return, risk reward spectrum. Some of them are very cheap, but they're also high risk of failure. Some of them are much more expensive and they're, they're high risk of success, meaning it's certainly going to happen. So you've got to look at your deal and find out which is the most appropriate. If I've got a little tiny deal that I might make $20,000 on, if it's going to work, I'm not going to invest $10,000 suing the lender to stop the foreclosure. If I'm only making 20 grand, it doesn't make sense. But there are some options in here that are free. And while they have a little risk, they're not always certain. They don't always work perfectly. You've got a low, a low profitability deal. So you're going to use a low risk, low cost method to try to stop the foreclosure. Now, you might have a $200,000 tax. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have a $200,000 tax bill on a $600,000 deal. Well, in that case, you're not looking to solve the foreclosure. You're looking to just postpone it usually, but you have a much higher risk. You also have a much higher potential profit. 
So you've got to come up with ways to postpone this foreclosure that makes sense. In the case of making a $600,000 profit deal that's got a big $200,000 tax bill, you're not going to want to risk taking the foreclosure postponement processes that have a low probability of winning, even though they're free. You're going to do the ones that have a very high probability of working, even though they're expensive, because you need this to work. You don't really care if you're going to risk the ten, twenty thousand dollar deal, but you really care if you're going to miss that two hundred or six hundred thousand dollar deal. So, you ask, you got to ask yourself: Is the juice worth the squeeze? I am always telling folks in my office that, and the reason now is we've learned to solve just about every problem related to real estate. But I always stop and ask the guys: Is the juice worth the squeeze? You're not going to go file a ten thousand dollar a lawsuit that costs ten thousand dollars to start if it's a tiny little problem that you're only going to make ten grand. That doesn't make sense. So just because you could doesn't mean you should. You got to make sure the juice is worth the squeeze. All right, so let's talk mortgage foreclosure. Actually, this should just say tax for or this should say foreclosure, not mortgage. The slide is wrong. But there are five ways, technically six, but the sixth one I'm not going to put a lot of time into, and I'll tell you why when we get there. But the ways to stop the foreclosure, we're going to start with the cheap and easy ones. They also don't have a really high probability of success. Um, oh, let me check. Anybody asking questions yet so far? Uh, somebody said, uh, John Linsky just got my first wholesaling deal. John Linsky got his first wholesaling deal. Good job, John. How much did you make, John? Tell us. And Martha, I will attend your next week meeting virtually. Martha, I love it. Yeah, we're going to go over this stuff and a ton more um, about the business of distressed real estate. This is one important part of it, but there's so much more to the business of distressed real estate. That's what we're going to be doing April 6th, which is this Saturday in Dallas. It's an eight-hour event. This isn't a speaker deal where everybody gets up there and tells you how smart and rich they are, why you should follow them. This is a training. You're paying me a reasonable amount of money. I will spend almost eight hours networking you with everybody in that room and training you on the business of distressed real estate. So let's get back to it. Foreclosure. This is the one that has a very low probability of being successful. I do this in our office and it probably works one out of half a dozen times. So one in five, one in six. And it's the most simple free way to postpone a foreclosure. Provide a listing agreement to the lender. The reason you're doing that is you're showing the lender that you're going to sell this property and you've listed it with a realtor and you're taking the right steps to make this work. This can work on a mortgage foreclosure. This can work on a tax foreclosure. And it does work. It literally happens at least once a month in our office. Um, you know, your odds are one in five, one in six, one in seven. So what that means is you only want to do this on a deal that is a low profit deal, a low risk deal, and you don't care about it that much, or you have a bunch of time. This is your first, kind of your first line of defense. So we know that it's going to fail five of the six times or six of the seven times. So what we do is we start out with this on almost every one of them. We try it. We either provide a listing agreement or a contract. The second one is very similar to the first. The first one is we would be providing a listing agreement signed with the realtor and the seller to the tax office or the mortgage lender saying, this thing is going to close here quickly. We just need to get the title report back and let them close. Can you please postpone the foreclosure sale? That's why you provide the listing agreement. Now, the second item is provide a lender receipted contract with proof of funds. That's the second option. That comes, let's say you're going through the process of selling your real estate because we all know the owner can't afford it anymore. The first line of defense is provide a listing agreement to a lender showing, here's the intent. We're going to sell it. This is what's going to happen. Now, if you're further along in the process, let's say it's already been listed or it's already been marketed to an investor or someone's working with a seller, you now have the ability to provide the lender with a receipted contract, a contract that's signed by the seller to a buyer like me, for example, and a proof of funds. You get those over to your lender. And now the, now the ask is a little bit better. 
your odds, the probability of it being successful goes up a little bit above the first one. Number two is provide the receipted contract with a proof of funds. And I always throw in there afterwards, be nice. <laughs> you get more, uh, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. You know, when you call people like hat in hand, um, high attorney trustee or big bank, we're really working with this seller to try to get this deal done so that you guys can get paid off completely. That way the seller doesn't lose all the equity in their home and you guys will have this poorly performing mortgage note done and off the books. It's only going to take us two weeks. So if you'll postpone this foreclosure, just push it off till next month. That gives us enough time to complete this contract. You see the closing dates in two or three weeks and here's the buyer's proof of funds. It's really going to happen lender. Please help us. That's your second line of defense. Somebody's asking if, if question is this Texas specific? No, uh, the question was just asking the comments. Is this Texas specific? No, it's not Texas specific. Um, this works all across the United States. Some some jurisdictions handle details differently. For example, um, I believe. New York is a judicial foreclosure state, meaning they don't have the power of sale and the deed of trust like we do in Texas. The foreclosure, the foreclosing lender, foreclosing attorney must file the lawsuit to foreclose. So you're going to be dealing with lawyers then instead of just the lender. But steps like this work still calling the lender and saying, look, we've got a buyer lined up. Here's the proof of money. Here's the contract. It's at the title company. These steps still work across the United States. Sometimes one can vary slightly from the other, but they still work. So I remind you, be nice, be polite, come hat in hand. You're asking for a favor. Put yourself in the lender's shoes for a minute. The lender has originated this mortgage to a person 12 years ago. The person hadn't made a payment in 11 years. They're 12 months behind. This lender has been paying its investors because Wells Fargo borrows money to make these payments or to make these notes. So Wells Fargo borrows money. They're now paying their investors every month, but they're not collecting the payment from the borrower. So they're in a bad spot when a loan goes bad in this case. So you're, you're wanting to be polite. You're wanting to ask them, guys, help me out here. I'm going to make it right. And the nicer you are to people, the better off, better off, the better your odds are of getting what you want. Now, the third step, this is a little more serious. This one happens and you're going to need a lawyer for this one. And this one isn't free either. This is the one that I do after I beg for forgiveness. Please don't sell the property. Here's proof we're going to close on it, yada, yada, yada. And the lender says, I don't care. This is a terrible loan. I want to get it off my books. And the uh, lender's trustee, the lawyer says, we don't care. We're going to sell it. F you get lost. When all the begging and pleading and being nice and showing proof of funds doesn't work, the next part of my conversation is, okay, great. Well, my attorney is going to file a temporary restraining order against you and your lender, Mr. Trustee. And if you won't pull this to be nice, we're going to file a temporary restraining order against you and stop and, and basically throw a wrench in your spokes. We're going to prevent your ability to do the mortgage foreclosure sale and you can't stop me. As long as the judge orders this temporary restraining order, the TRO, it's only going to cost me $2,000 to have my attorney run down there and file this and get an emergency hearing and it will completely stop your ability to foreclose on me. So I'm letting you know this now, this is my last kind of plea with you. Uh, but if you won't postpone the foreclosure based on the fact that it's going to close quickly, we have a contract that we can deal with that. If you won't do that, then I'm going to spend the money, file a restraining order and the judge will stop you from selling it. That way I can have time to clean up the title work, get the closing, and get you paid and get it all done so we don't lose the equity, it's restraining order time. Now, remember, the first two options were free. This is the third option. It's not free. But the neat thing is it ain't that expensive. Two grand. And while $2,000 sounds like a lot, if you're talking about maybe the cost of lunch for comparison, when you're talking about making 20, 30, 50,000, 100 grand, half a million bucks on a foreclosure deal, the two grand is a very effective tool for the price, but it is not guaranteed. So I would say about one in 10, we have about a 90% success rate with these. 
what it is, what you're doing is you're filing an emergency restraining order, an emergency action in that court, and you've got to have an emergency hearing within a day. And you go in and your attorney goes into the judge and basically says, look, your honor, we have a contract in place. You know, this poor homeowner is going to lose all their equity and this contract is going to be extinguished if you don't postpone this so that we can get um, get the time to close this deal. Judges like to grant temporary restraining orders. They always do that. The reason is they want to provide the status quo and don't want anything major to change or anything to happen until they can have time to sort through it and just get a little bit of a little bit of space and time. So the neat thing is temporary restraining orders are very often granted. So that's on your side. Um, sometimes you've got situations like the borrower wasn't properly noticed or maybe there's a, there's a disagreement between the lender and the borrower about the loan balance or some of that. Those are other issues that you might need to raise, but unless you have an open lawsuit, there's no real forum to get, um, to get adjudication there. You don't really have any judge looking over your conversation with the borrower or with the lender. So by filing temporary restraining order, you can ask the judge to postpone the foreclosure. And now let's get the dispute between the borrower and the lender out in front of a judge and see what the judge thinks. But we're not going to have to go that far. Usually you file a restraining order. The temporary restraining order is good for two to two weeks. After those two weeks, you have to have a temporary injunction hearing. But here's the kicker. In Texas, foreclosure happens, foreclosure auctions happen once a month. So the first Tuesday of every month. So if you file yourself a restraining order on the 6th, which is the first Tuesday, and the restraining order is only good for two weeks, but the next foreclosure sale isn't for four weeks, that TRO that's good for two weeks is effectively good for four weeks. So you bought yourself four weeks of time. Do you have referrals of attorneys that will file TRO? Referrals for attorneys. You know, I've got attorneys that work directly for me. Um, they're my direct attorneys. They do nothing but work for me. There are a ton of folks that do um, that do that kind of work. That was Luan Tron. That was who? Luan. Okay. Yeah, Luan. I don't have somebody, a referral here. Um, I've got my attorneys. Now, I will tell you, I've got an attorney that's, a new one that's supposed to be working for me. And if they have spare variable time, I could make those referrals to y'all. But here's the easy answer. Just ask around. You can even call your title company and get a referral to a local real estate attorney who's pretty good. And if an attorney, a local real estate attorney has a deal where they're the fee attorney for the title company, man, they're going to be a pretty decent attorney. So either they can do a temporary restraining order for you or they can refer you to someone that can. Tony says, do you need something signed by seller? in order to even talk with a lender? Tony. Tony, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't think about it. You absolutely do. Um, there are two things. There's an, an affidavit that the seller has to fight, that has to sign for the temporary restraining order application. And you've got basically a seller um, authorization that allows you to talk to the lender, the county, um, any other party about anything related to that specific loan. I just get a power of attorney. If I'm already going to get them to sign something and we're already going through this work, I just get a, a power of attorney, which allows me to do business on their behalf. It allows me to communicate on their behalf. That way I can do what I want when I want to help get this taken care of for them. So I get power of attorneys in those cases. Jay says, what department are you speaking to at the lender for this? The trustee or what department of lender typically? Jay. Okay, Jay. So Jay asks, what department within the loan company are you talking to? And that really depends. The first person I'm going to call is a trustee. There's going to be a notice of sale posted in the land records that says a certain trustee, which is a lawyer, is going to sell a property on the borrower's behalf or on the lender's behalf. I call the trustee first. Sometimes you get lucky and the trustee's a nice guy and they're easy to deal with. Um, and sometimes if you give them a good plea, they'll tell you, let me call the lender and I'll get back with you. And as long as you bought, got some time, it's not the day before the foreclosure, you have time to do that. Um, one of the challenges is the bigger the bank, the harder it is to get through to them. So you're going to a lot. They, each bank has different departments. Some of them have special servicing departments. Some of them have foreclosure departments. You're going to have to call into that number where you're going to get a, a mortgage statement from the borrower because they should have a copy of it, or you're going to Google search their lender's name and whatever de different departments they have. You're going to have to look at the most appropriate one and call them. Once you get in their ecosystem, they'll direct you to the right direction. But 
You're going to have to take that power of attorney, that loan authorization form you have, and email that in. It's going to take them 24 to 48 hours to have their legal team review it and then grant you that authority. So now you can see if you're not getting this done quickly, if this is something that's happening like, I don't know, three days before the mortgage, the foreclosure, you're in a pinch for time and you have to take a more serious approach. But if you're doing this two or three weeks before the foreclosure, you got time to send the power of attorney or the authorization form into the lender. And then that lender can vet it and then add you to the loan account for this particular situation. But usually there are specialty departments for that. Marcus, I operate with foreclosures in six markets. Do you suggest having one attorney on retainer or each state individually for my company? Marcus. Marcus Marcus is asking, since he works in six different markets, he wants to know if he can have a single attorney work all of the different jurisdictions for his restraining orders. I usually pick an attorney that works in that jurisdiction or that region. So, for example, um, I still do a fair amount in San Antonio. I've got local San Antonio attorneys here that do that because they know the judges, they know just, they know the courthouse, they know the clerks, they just know how to get stuff done quicker. Um, and you got a better shot if your attorney has been in front of these judges a lot and they've got trust and rapport with them, you're going to have a better shot with your attorney getting what they want for you as opposed to getting some attorney from North Texas to file something down here in Hidalgo County in the Valley. They don't know the guy. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's like a fish out of water. So I try to have attorneys for the region. I've got it split up. I've got an Eastern region of Texas. I've got an attorney that works that one. I've got a Southern region. I've got one that works there and then a separate one for North. So I kind of have it split up in regions. Um, and we've got a lot of counties we work in often. So you start to kind of get the familiarity. Um, yeah. Hope that answered your question. Uh, you got more questions? Phillips, Adam, Phillips says, how do you get around that being a self-serving power of attorney? Well, so if you have a general power of attorney, and Philip, all right, Philip. So you're asking, how do you get around um, a conflict of interest with the power of attorney? Is what you think you're saying. I don't get a power of attorney to be general and reaching and a lot and sweeping and let me do everything on behalf of the seller. It's a very specific power of attorney that allows me to communicate with the lender and negotiate with the lender and lender's trustee. And that's it. If you get a very broad reaching one, I think you're going to have some, um, some problems with conflict because you're obviously a counterparty to them. And if you're now negotiating on their behalf in the capacity of a buyer or seller, you have problems. But if you're only doing it to postpone the foreclosure and, and collect mortgage statements and things like that, I don't see a problem and I've not had issues. I've been doing it for 10 years like that. We got any more questions before we move on? Uh, Marcus uh, recommends also great to build relationships with trustees as you use them. They will work hard for you. Man, Marcus, that is a really, really, really good point. And it's not exclusive to trustees. Marcus is saying to build relationships with the trustees because your life is going to get easier and they'll do a lot for you. So what he's talking about is, let's say, for example, you continue to do foreclosure in Bear County often and you get to know Kevin Barry, Deborah Martin. You know, there's a pile, there's a group of attorneys that are always doing the foreclosure trustee work. As you get to do business and know them, then they know that you're a good person. You do what you say you're going to do. Once you call them and tell them you need a postponement, they're much more willing to work with you because they know that you're a legitimate person that does what they say they're going to do and they like you. But that needs to extend further. That needs to extend to everybody in this field. The better person, the better of a person you are, the better things are going to work for you. I'm super nice and polite to all of our vendors, our attorneys, our surveyors, process servers, all the folks in that legal field. I treat them well. I pay my invoices immediately. I just I become a really good customer. And the reason I work so hard to be a great customer of theirs is just like what he was, the question he was asking. When I need something done, there's never a question. They do it. They work with us because they know that you're a good person and you're doing You do what you say you're going to do. You know, I've got the ability to get on my cell phone right now. And there's probably two dozen attorneys that will answer my personal cell phone at night and on the weekends. Most people on these calls can't get an attorney to call them back within two weeks and I'll get them second ring on a weekend. But the only reason is I've spent 10 years building that reputation and relationship. And every time I've worked with them or hired them, I have been an incredibly good client for them. And that's kind of helped 
what builds your, builds your, um, I guess your going concern there. So, all right, that's number three. So the first one is provide a listing agreement to the lender and be nice. The second one is provide a receipted contract with a proof of funds to the lender and also be nice. The third one is a temporary restraining order. It's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars. You know, my attorney that does them all the time for me, he's down to a flat rate fee of $1,500 a pop. But if there's a new attorney for you, he hasn't done these before, he's going to charge you hourly, you're going to spend two or 3000 bucks. Yeah, it ain't free, but at the end of the day, if it's stopping this big foreclosure, spend the money, move on. Now, the first two, it's a flip of a coin, whether they're working or not. In fact, they only work 10 or 20% of the time at best. Um, your temporary restraining order, the third item, that one works about 90% of the time. We really have good luck with those, but it doesn't always work. And the reason is a judge might say, you know what? I don't really care. I know your plea borrower is that you've got a contract and you need to complete your closing so that you don't lose your equity and then you can pay back this lender. But some judges say, don't care. You've been in foreclosure a year and a half. Um, you've had plenty of time to do this and you haven't done it. I'm not going to stop the foreclosure for you. That happens. Sometimes um, I file temporary restraining orders against the uh, counties a lot. And some judges say, you know what? This is a county office you're filing a restraining order against. I'm not going to grant it. You need to figure out how to pay this debt or get lost. That happens a lot too. So the fourth one is a much more serious, a much more serious procedure. It's called a bill of review. And when you've got a judicial foreclosure, this will be a tax foreclosure and then a mortgage foreclosure in certain states that require judicial foreclosures for mortgages. A bill of review allows you to basically what it says, you're reviewing that lawsuit to make sure civil practice and procedure was done perfect. No notices were missed. The filings were done correctly. Everything was done as it was supposed to. You've got four years after the date of the final order to file a bill of review. Now, the neat thing is when you're doing a temporary restraining order, that's an application. You're hoping to get that granted. But when you're filing a bill of review, that's a declaration, more or less. It's not an application. Well, technically, all these legal filings are applications, but it's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit more of a right than the restraining or the restraining order is you're just, you're hoping the bill of review. It's a file where you're declaring that you're going to open up that lawsuit and review everything that happened in it. And you've got, I don't know. I think it's like 21 days after you file that there are 21 days and the counterparty, which would be the County or the lender has to file their answer. And you've got a lot of deadlines and back and forth. What that effectively does is, it's postponing that foreclosure because you file a bill of review with an injunction or with a restraining order. And almost every time you're going to get that injunction or that restraining order granted when your bill of review is being filed, but it's not a cheapy 1500 or $2,000 filing. That bill of review is a full fledged lawsuit. You know, the, the uh, pleading that your attorney's going to file is going to be 10 pages, all the facts, what you're looking for. Now you need to, hopefully have some mistake that you can identify that you're making this bill of review for. You can't just say, I want to review it for fun. Um, and we, we find that the tax foreclosures, there is almost always at least 50% of the time, there's a mistake in the tax foreclosures. An error wasn't served. They left people out completely. I mean, there are tons of mistakes in the tax foreclosures. So we can usually find a good reason to find the, file the bill of review. And that buys you a bunch of time. Once you file that bill of review, you've got months and months and months of deadlines and filings. But the other part of that is I've never had a bill of review not been allowed. Once you file it with the clerk, it's served on the counterparty and you get your injunction hearing pretty quickly or your restraining order hearing. So the, I've never had this not work. So for me, it's 100% success right now. The price point goes up. This isn't a $2,000 skeleton petition like a TRO. This is a much more serious lawsuit and it's going to cost you five grand to get that filed. But if you go to multiple hearings and you're trying to stave off that lender, you can spend a lot more than $5,000 keeping that alive. So remember, this is not filed to fix all the problems. This is filed to throw a wrench in the spokes of that foreclosure sale 
so you can complete your transaction, get your title report, get the money you need and close or round up that last seller who they can't find and get yourself to the finish line. But in this bill of review, it costs a little bit more, but my success rate has been 100%. I'm apprehensive to say 100% because we know how that works. The moment you say 100%, it's not going to work for somebody and you're mad at me. Uh, let's see. Anna, before we hit our fifth and sixth, we got any other questions we need to address real quick? Yes. Um, do you find, uh, Eric, do you find the change in the trustee the best method to get fresh for foreclosure? Or is that too soon? Not enough distress felt that early. The what was it? Do you find the, the change in the trustee? Oh, the substitute trustee. Get, yeah. Eric's asking if the substitute trustee filing is um, one of the best early indicators for foreclosure, or is that too early in the process he's saying? So let me explain what that is. Let's say I go borrow some money to buy a house, and the Wells Fargo is my lender, and they appoint. I don't know, Joe Schmo as the trustee lawyer on my loan documents. If I go into default and don't make my payments, that trustee starts to file notices to send me notices and file foreclosure postings. But let's just say that that attorney that was the trustee, when I bought, got my mortgage, maybe he died. Maybe he doesn't work for the bank anymore. When you're doing massive banks like Wells Fargo or like the big boys, I mean, they got new attorneys and groups all the time. So if attorney A is listed on your document, your mortgage document, he can't do the foreclosure because he's no longer there. So what the bank will file, it's called a substitute trustee notice. And what the what that is, is the bank is saying, we used to have Joe Schmo, and now we're going to replace that attorney with a new one. It's a notice of substitute trustee filing. And the only reason you're going to file that is because you got a foreclosure coming or there's a group of foreclosures or the public just want, the bank wants to notice that they've got new trusteeship. But I think that's a great time, Eric. And the reason is a foreclosure is coming down the pipeline and it might be next month or it might be in six months. But the point is the moment the person that owns a property gets behind, that's a sign of distress. And that's the time to start working that deal. So the notice of substitute trustee, appointment, that's going to be the very first public notice of a mortgage going bad. There will be no other early indicators anywhere in the land record. So the moment you see that, start them on a campaign. All right, Eric. So back to the bill of review. That one is a pretty certain answer. Um, it's a little more expensive and you're going to need an attorney who knows they're doing on this, but this, you're going to use this one on the time where you've got a big tax bill, for example, you know, sometimes we have a tiny tax bill of like five grand or a $5,000 delinquent amount. That's small relative to the value of the property. In this case, you're just going to go on ahead and hire the attorney, pay the five grand to postpone it and get this bill review filed. It also works when you have a very big deal. Like let's say sometimes I've got deals that have a hundred, two, three, four hundred thousand in equity. I do not want to risk anything going wrong with this. So I'm willing to pay the money. I'm willing to get the good postponement that's certain. Um, and at that point, when I ask you, is the juice worth the squeeze? It starts to become more of a yes answer as the value grows and the risk grows. Let's just say your risk is that it's a hundred thousand dollar equity you're picking up on this deal. You don't want to stop at the first one or two answers by providing a listing agreement to the lender or providing a um, uh, executed contract proof of funds. And they say, no, you don't want to stop there because your risk is so high that you're going to lose a large amount of profit, you really want to spend more money to make this one work. So as you go down this list, the cost starts to go up, but the certainty goes up. So as you get the bigger deals, the more profitable, the ones that you want to least risk low, you want to risk losing the least, you start to employ further down the chart. Um, now, this is the last one. This is not one that I will say you always want to do, but I will tell you this works 100% of the time. 100% of the time, it works 100% of the time. <laughs> so paying the reinstatement amount, which effectively reinstates the borrower's loan. I had to do this yesterday. Um, I couldn't get all the information from the trustee quickly enough. They weren't communicating with my attorney that was initiated the day before because a seller jumped on board and said they want to work with me. Now, the, the loan was like $100,000 balance. 
and I only have a contract with the seller at this time. I haven't closed. I don't own it. And I didn't want to start spending a ton of legal bills, but dollar for dollar on the reinstatement, I feel I felt like that was the best answer. So we got the reinstatement amount from the loan servicer and wired that money to the trustee office immediately. We didn't have um, the loan servicer was telling us to pay the trustee. The trustee wasn't getting back to us. And we only had one day till the sale. And it would actually have been tight if we were filing a restraining order. So I thought, you know what? As long as I get that money out of my hands into the hands of one of the lender's parties, be it the loan servicer, be it the trustee, be it the lender, as long as I got proof that I wired this money to them, whether they've received it yet or not, whether they know that I've done it or not, doesn't matter. So we sent that outbound wire yesterday, reinstated the loan. We, the loan uh, was like 10500 mid-10s. So we sent an amendment to the seller that said we're getting credit dollar for dollar for this loan reinstatement when we close on the sale. And then I wired that money out to that lender. Well, actually to the trustee's um, law firm account, the law firm's IOLTA account, the trust account. I wired that money to him. But I wired 12000 They told us the reinstatement was ten five, but I didn't want to risk there being some other fees or something like that that they forgot to tell us or had technicality. So I overpaid a little, wired the money, and then got that proof of wire from my treasury management platform and emailed it to the lender, uh, the lender's trustee, the lawyer, and then I sent it to the loan servicing. It literally sent all over the place so that we have done proper notice to them. And after that, I didn't get word back from them until this morning the foreclosure was pulled, but I knew that we'd paid the money to reinstatement. And even if they screwed up and went to the sale and auctioned off the property, I could get that foreclosure set aside because we had made the payment to reinstate it. So I knew we were safe, but paying off the reinstatement is one way. It's a little more expensive and you got to look at your, your contract and look at your timeline and say, do we have clear title? Is it a dollar amount that I'm willing to that I'm willing to spend and feel comfortable that I'll get reimbursed. Um, the other thing is pay it off. When we were doing the uh, mortgage foreclosures super heavy, you know, four or five years ago, we were driving the week before the foreclosure sale. It got to the point where it was too hard to get into these big lenders to try to get, um, to get a good postponement or something worked out. We would just hurry up and get a title report and close, but there wasn't enough time to close through title. So we would close without it. I'm driving checks all across this county. We're wiring it to the big banks. We would just pay the dead gum thing off. We knew we were buying the property. We liked the price. Um, and I frankly was, I didn't want to spend five or 10,000 illegal fees on a $70,000 deal. So at that point, it was just pay the thing off. It is the most costly option of all these. But think about it. As long as there's nothing standing your way to close, you're going to pay it anyway when you close the deal. So if you can speed that time frame up and get the money paid quickly, then it works. So, but this will be the most expensive. You're going to have to act the quickest, but it has the highest success rate. We got any other questions yes, that popped up? Uh, Marcus says, I would, I would get a specific POA sign, Marcus. reinstate, purchase sub two, and have post-occupancy agreement executed. Works great as long as the, all parties are cooperative. Man, Marcus, you're absolutely right. So Marcus says, get a contract, get a specific um, power of attorney, um, purchase the property sub two, and then get a, a post-occupancy agreement yep. executed. Post-occupancy agreement executed. So it's funny you say that. I've got one I'm doing right now, the one we talked about yesterday that is very similar to that. As all, if all parties are compliant and willing to work with you and communicative, that's great. You can't. I get a lot of times I get these calls three business days before the foreclosure sale and you've got to act so fast. It's hard to get all those in place. But if someone's calling you two weeks before the foreclosure sale, a model like that works really well and you've got all the time. Um, the only thing I would add to that little bundle right there is the one I did yesterday also included an owner finance component. I still have some title work to get done and a few other things. So I'm now closing on it quickly and I'm only giving them 5,000 down and I'm reinstating the mortgage, which I did yesterday. I'm going to pay the mortgage for two months while we clean up the title problems, but I'm going to close now with the title problems, and they've got an occupant. Their daughter's going to stay in it. This gives me 60 days to clean up title problems, get daughter moved out, and then I'll pay off the remaining balance on the mortgage. 
So yeah, you're getting creative, Marcus. Good move, man. I like it. If you're going to do pre foreclosures, you have got to get creative. You must. And if you do, if you're fast, aggressive, and creative, man, the income you can make on this business line is absolutely incredible. Marcus says that he loves your creativity. Marcus, he so, loves his creativity. No, your creativity. Oh, uh, do oh I, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I appreciate that, Marcus. Yeah. Um, okay. Now here's another one. I didn't put this as a full bullet point. And the reason is I'm not a big fan of this. It's based, it's called bankruptcy. A lot of people file bankruptcy. Um, it's a pro se notice for, I don't know what chapter they pick. It depends, but it's just like a two page petition. You can go in the court, print it out, fill it out and file a notice of bankruptcy and then appear to bankruptcy hearing. I've seen people file the notice of bankruptcy, which will stop the foreclosure or the lender will not sell it. The moment you notice them, it's a notice of bankruptcy. The lender will stop the foreclosure and then you're supposed to actually file the bankruptcy pleading and then go to some hearings. Folks have told me they'll do this, but the moment you start filing this stuff, you've got a risk of having credit problems for much, much worse and much longer than a person would already have. That can get out of hand. Um, I would never recommend a seller do that just because I, I don't want to get involved in that. I'm not going to create any new problems for these folks. They might have their own problems and I'm going to resolve the ones that I'm involved in because of the real estate, but I'm not, I don't really want to recommend people file bankruptcy. I've seen it a lot. It's just not in my bag, but what they do is they'll file a notice of bankruptcy to stop the foreclosure. Then you get your closing done. And then that same person will file the dismissal. So technically they don't actually open the full bankruptcy. So the way I understand it is it doesn't actually hit their credit, but I don't know. Marcus calls it skeleton bankruptcy. Yeah. So earlier I made the comment skeleton pleading means it's a very thin basic lawsuit. You just get filed to be a, to be effective and get a placeholder. What you're saying is a skeleton bank skeleton bankruptcy. It's that's just a, a very basic um, pleading. It's not a big, like real legitimate one. You don't intend to actually litigate that. You know, I've seen creditors that file bankruptcy cases and I mean, they have like a 50 page or hundred page petition with um, exhibits and just huge amounts of citations and all that's a full flood, full pleading. These are just a basic form to throw again, throw a wrench um, in the spokes of the foreclosure. All right. Those are my most trusty ways to get this done. I'll give you a couple examples of how this can play out sometimes, but you know, I've got a half a dozen to a dozen of these things every single month. I've got an attorney that works in-house full-time for me. I have two other law firms that are third party. So we're working on this stuff like two weeks of every month. We're, we're full force on these. And I've seen every, every game in the book um, so much so that the attorneys that work for the tax law firms and the big mortgage trustees, we know all of them by name. They know us. They're like, oh, it's these guys again. And while sometimes they get frustrated, our model is stop their foreclosure. They've been working so long to execute. They also know that when we do that, they're going to get paid pretty soon. And if they pull the foreclosure based on what we tell them or show them, we're not going to make them look bad by not closing or not handling business. We're getting our business done and they can count on us. So now I brought this one up. Marcus earlier brought up the... Um, the, the creative approach to his pulling his foreclosure. And this was a very similar one. Um, we asked in good faith for the foreclosing entity to not do the foreclosure and showed them contract and proof of funds. They didn't care. We told them, look, we're going to pay in full. And they said, yeah, we're going to get paid in full at the auction too, which they were right. So that didn't work. So then at that moment, we were, and this was yesterday, foreclosure auction was this morning. This is yesterday afternoon because a seller finally agreed to sell to us. There was one day and two hours left, actually less than that, half a day plus two hours left before that sale. So I didn't know if we were going to be filing a TRO or negotiating with a lender. So in one office, someone's in our office drafting the TRO, the temporary restraining order pleadings. They're feverishly working on that. Then we've got another party who's calling the loan servicing company who services this debt to see if they can get the property agreed to be pulled. And then another party, the attorney, is calling um, the trustee 
letting them know that, hey, if you guys don't pull this, we're going to follow the restraining order. So we had three different channels worked out. And I actually hadn't even asked what the restraining order or what the uh, reinstatement amount was. And it just so happened to come across my desk. And when I saw the reinstatement was 10 grand, this is a smoking deal. There's at least 100,000 in margin for us. The moment I saw that it was $10,000 for the reinstatement, I just said, forget it. Send the 10 grand. We'll get credit towards the mortgage. Let's just get this done because it's, you know, we're running three different channels, hoping which one's going to work. So the way that deal worked is I've got a lease back for 30 to 60 days for the seller's daughter. We're doing an owner finance closing tomorrow where I'm going to give them $5,000 down. I'm going to pay the mortgage for the next two months or one or two months while the seller's daughter is living in it. And then once that's done, they're going to move out. I'm going to pay off the mortgage. I'm going to pay the balance of the proceeds. So we're buying sub two also. Then pay off the balance of that mortgage uh, to the lender and be done. So that, that one I'm spending about $125,000 to buy that one. Um, it's worth about $250,000, $275,000 as it sits. So we'll be able to close on it, um, mow the grass, trim the trees, haul some trash out of it. And we're going to list that sucker right on MLS. So that should be at $100,000 quick flip. So that's one reason, one way we do this. Um, another one I had recently, this was in Houston, Texas. The one we just talked about was a mortgage foreclosure. The one I'm talking about here is in Houston, Texas. The deal's worth about $500,000, but it's got a hundred grand owed in taxes and no mortgage, but it's got multiple owners. There's some fighting going on. And I, you know, sometimes you can work out a payment plan with the tax office. Um, that, you know what? That's something I failed to mention earlier. A payment plan um, with your tax entity is another option instead of paying it completely or reinstating it and getting a payment plan. But you know what? I better write that down to add that. I got to add that into my presentation for next time. Um, yeah, but in this case, I just looked at it and said, okay, how serious is this? It's a half a million dollar property. We got a big tax bill and I'm still dealing with some ownership arguments. So I'm going to go on ahead and file the bill of review because two heirs of this property were not noticed by the tax entity that was foreclosing. We went back to him and showed him you didn't notice these two people and they claimed that they did um, citation by publication. We weren't sure if that was sufficient or not. So we use that to file the bill of review. I owe legal bills on this thing are like 10 grand now. And sometimes I look at it and say, should I just pay the hundred grand in taxes? Because 10,000 is a lot of money to not have to pay a hundred grand in taxes, 10%. Kind of in effect, it's a 10% penalty. But in my case, if something goes wrong and we want to walk out of the deal, I'd rather ten, pay 10 grand on legal fees to solve my problems. And then I can just walk away if I need to and I'll lose 10 grand. But if I paid the hundred grand and had big problems, I can't walk away from that. You know, we're pregnant, got to have that baby. So in this case, we got 90 days to get things, get things situated. And the interesting part is I had one last party that wouldn't agree to us. We got all the parties purchased. One party was a holdout. So I went back to the tax office and said, forget it. I'm going to withdraw my bill of review and I'm going to non-suit it. And as long as you add me, now that I've just gotten deeds, I'm going to add myself in the tax lawsuit. As long as you'll add me in and notice me, then I'm going to let you go foreclose on it. And I'm backed up. What that does is that means that last guy who wouldn't work with us, it's still going to get sold, but it's going to go at a, at a pretty high price because it's Houston. So we'll let it go to the sale and I'll collect my 85% in excess proceeds, which means I won't be paying the taxes. I'm only out the 30 or 50 grand that I paid to buy the 85% share of the property. So in this case, we did the bill of review to postpone the sale, then negotiated and backed off. And we're doing an agreement to let the tax office sell the foreclosure. But now that we are listed in the tax lawsuit as an owner, because we bought the interest in the property, except one owner on the way, now we'll let it foreclose and get our excess proceeds. That way we don't have to solve the, for the last person who's being a holdout. Sounds a little complicated when that went from a, just a standard foreclosure postponement to a new exit strategy. We got any more, uh, fellow, any other new questions? Okay. So you see how these foreclosure postponements can take different, um, they can take different routes depending on how things develop. But I will remind you, this is the last kind of tip or trick I'm going to 
um, I'm going to offer you, you get more flies, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Don't be an asshole. Be nice. Be polite. Yes, you're dealing with people that have financial hardship. Be respectful to them. They might just be going through a bad time. They may not be a bad person. It ain't your job to judge them. It's your job to get in here and solve this issue and make your money for your business and get the seller paid and move on. Same goes for everyone in this equation. You're going to be dealing with judges sometimes. You're going to be dealing with attorneys. You're going to deal with tax law firms. Be polite to everybody. Be respectful. You would be amazing how much further, how much more ground you pick up by just being a good person. So do that. I'll tell you, one in five of our uh, foreclosures get pulled because we're polite and we ask and we receive. So do that. Um, you know, one of the other examples, oh, I, I bring this up earlier. I talked about um, us paying off the reinstatement amount. I think I did mention this. We paid off countless. I've probably paid off a hundred mortgages the day before the foreclosure auction because it was easier. We had a good title report. Everything was ready. And I just, we didn't have still time to close through title, but I went to the seller's house with a deed, got the deed, went and paid the taxes. Then went back and gave the seller the excess amount. That was the difference between the purchase price and the co and the tax debt, that extra 10, 20, 50 grand, I gave it to them and then drove and recorded the deed. So that's, that's the last tip I got on that one. Um, somebody said, well, we, we got some questions. What do we got? It, Tony says, it seems like more and more states make foreclosure more difficult for primary residences. Any difference or competitive advantage going after commercial investments, second home properties? Any risk in working with primary residence deals? Tony, that's three questions. I'm not, that's not one question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony, I'll kind of address your main topic. Your main topic was that it generally looks like states are making it um, tougher and tougher um, on the foreclosure process to get the foreclosure done. And it's tougher and tougher on the investor and easier on the homeowner. You know, it depends on where you're at. You know, Texas had some lenient laws on foreclosures during the pandemic, you know, the COVID deal. Uh, but outside of that, you know, we, we have it really good, actually. We've got really good laws here um investors and homeowners i think they have a fair shake here in texas it depends on what state you're going to as to what those laws look like i'm starting to see some states get more um more lenient and then i'm seeing some of them kind of tighten up i've seen florida has just recently passed some laws to make it much easier for the lender to or the landlord to evict the tenant or do the foreclosure and get them out of there tenant uh, florida is tightening some of that up so I don't know, man. The rules, legislative and judicial risk is always going to be a part of the investing business. You're just going to have to keep your eyes out there, keep your eyes open on what's changing and decide how you're going to work in it. You got to know the rules. It's going to be hard for you to change them. So you're going to have to navigate that landscape. But I'll tell you this, Texas is probably the best state for messy real estate deals because we have incredible laws. It's a huge state. We have a ton of value here high price properties. It's a great place to do it. But this stuff works across the United States. Salvo, what else? Any more questions? No more questions. Does it show the viewer count on there right now? No. Uh, no. It's wrong because here it says 25, but there's more on, on YouTube. On everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Talk about the, and LinkedIn. And also. Okay. I'll tell you what. I would encourage y'all to reach out to us. I do a ton of JVs with people like this. I got two things I'll point out to you. If you're on this journey and looking to get better, looking to learn more and looking to do deals with people that know what they're doing, you came to the right place. Um, we do a ton of JVs with people. In fact, the one I was telling you that I stopped yesterday, um, that was a JV. Somebody called me and said, look, I'm, I'm staring down the staring down a hundred grand in equity but it's so late in the game, I don't know what to do. So I decided to partner with them and jumped in and dealt with that part of it. So JVs happen all the time. If you want to send us um, an email, info at ARPUSA.com. It's I-N-F-O at ARPUSA.com. Shoot me an email. If I don't get it, one of the partners in the office will get it. That email gets responded to within one business day. So that's a great line of communication for us. Also, I'll tell you, this is like one little piece of the entire equation of 
purchasing distressed property. Um, in Dallas, April 6th, which is this Saturday, me and a bunch of the guys from my office are doing an entire workshop. It's not a speaker event where everyone tells you how bad their life was. Now they found this and their life is better and how rich and smart they are. It ain't that. It is a workshop, a full eight hour day of networking and training on distressed property, what the leads look like, how to find them, how to market to them, how to strategically negotiate these kind of deals, and then what running a business like this looks like. Be it a small operation with one person, a big operation like I've got with 20. We talk about starting, running, managing all shapes of businesses in between the tiny to the big. That way you can leave this event and you'll know where you're going, what you're doing, and what it should look like in the first four months and then the first year. That's my plan. It's, a, it's my opinion. It's a smoking good deal. For 550 bucks. you've got eight hours of some of the most detailed training that anyone will give you in the real estate space. That's me. That's why we do it. Our event brings people together. It brings a ton of information out in the forefront. This information has taken me 10 years to learn technically here with my operation, my company, my lawyers, my experience, my money. After that 10 years, that's how to develop this model. And for a very fair price, I'm giving it out there to you. Um, also, that does create great JV opportunities. I mentioned earlier, I'll mention it again. When you've got unmarketable title, meaning property can't close through a tra traditional sale because you've got judgments that outvalue the property, you have liens that outvalue the property, multiple owners, unresolved estates, fighting owners, breaks in the title chain, landlocked properties, any of these problems that prevent the property from selling cleanly and easily, that's what we take a look at. Now, the juice has got to be worth the squeeze, so don't forget that. But send them in at info at ARPUSA.com. Shoot it in. We'll get you an answer and say, love it. We want to do the deal. We'll split it with you. We'll partner with you. Or we'll say, we don't like it, and here's why. So appreciate your time. Please like and share this. If you want these to keep going, hit the share button. Get it out to more people because the bigger we grow this community, the better we're going to be in it and the more resources we have. Thanks a lot. Logan Fulmer, I'm out.